and uh, welcome to the Whirlwind Cross Canada Tour of Elizabeth May, who is, uh, has been to Halifax, I've heard. Tuesday night. Tuesday night. <laughs> 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 On the Wednesday night, Ganges. <laughs> Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Victoria, Friday, White Horse. I'll stop there. Excuse me. <laughs> I've, been, uh, I've been asked to uh, introduce Elizabeth and to welcome her to these ancestral lands that we are so fortunate to be able to use. Uh, before starting, I have been given something to read from Kelsey. Is Kelsey here? No, she was here, she read it. Yeah, okay. Kelsey is, uh, uh, is the chairperson of the University of Victoria Student Society. We were talking about uh, something we're going to do. Uh, say something about Parship BC. It's a gathering organized by Youth for Youth that focuses on climate justice. We'll bring together hundreds of youth from diverse backgrounds across British Columbia and as far east as Winnipeg to learn, develop their skills, and build the movement for climate, environmental, and social justice. And it's coming to Victoria, unceded Coast Salish territories, October the 4th to the 7th. Get your calendars out right now. Workshops will take place on campus at the University of Victoria, and keynote speakers include David Suzuki, Mark Barlow, and Crystal Lehman. You can let people know that there will be someone tabling at the event on Thursday hopefully Sunday tonight, uh, to answer any of their questions and get them registered for the conference. So we also still really need any donations and financial support we can get. More information available at www.brpowership.ca. There's my duty done in that regard. <laughs> to introduce Elizabeth May to you, I want to start by saying she is both a politician and a lawyer. <laughs> Which shows you how good she is at turning upside down stereotypes. <laughs> Elizabeth graduated from law school at the University of Dalhousie. And we have many friends who are still teaching at the uh, University of Dalhousie who I get stories from every now and again, <laughs> just to uh, relate to me how she behaved as a student. <laughs> None of these stories will I tell you tonight. <laughs> Mainly because she would become conceited, which is the last thing that we want. But I do want to tell you a story from these days that typifies the Elizabeth May that we know. It was shortly after she had graduated from law school. And where was she on her graduation day? She was in the courtroom in a case, Vicky Palmer et al. against Monsanto. She was not a lawyer at that stage, and her hands were tied. She could not speak. She was going to be articling with a lawyer whose name I actually forget, but who had been physically damaged by uh, Nepal in Vietnam. And the problem was that Elizabeth May needed to get her articling papers delivered to the Law Society in Halifax. And her mother, a legendary figure in Nova Scotia, <laughs> even more famous, <laughs> Her mother delivered these papers to the Law Society in Halifax when Elizabeth was sitting in court. A phone rang in the courtroom in Cape Breton where she is sitting waiting and her mother's voice comes through and says, you are now an articling student. At which point Elizabeth stood up and cross-examined the expert witness <laughs> Now, you will remember when the Senate scandal was going on, how Tom Mulcair asked some very solid, stolid questions to our Prime Minister about what was actually going on and how the media just went weak at their knees about what a great cross-examiner he was. His courtroom powers are just so important for his parliamentary career. Well, let me take it from me. Trust me on this one. If you are ever a witness 
in a courtroom. You do not want to be cross-examined by this woman. <laughs> Even the thought of it makes me scared. <laughs> After articling in Nova Scotia, Elizabeth May moved to Ontario, where she became counsel for the Public Interest uh, Advocacy Center. And I think it was at that time that I got to know her. And they shocked all her friends, appalled her friends, when she became the policy analyst advisor to Paul McMillan, who then was the Minister of the Environment in the Mulroney government. Darth Vader, <laughs> incarnate it seemed. But no, she learned some skills in politics and in policy analysis. And lo and behold, Tom McMillan's policies improved. Yeah. So after that, there is, we know Elizabeth is the executive director of the Sierra Club of Canada. We know her as the author of seven books, only two of which I've read. Uh, she'll kill me for that. Uh, and, but we all know that she really came into her own when she became the member of parliament for Saanich of the Islands. Mm -hmm. Let me just say that the property bubble that you are now experiencing on Salt Spring Island is caused by all the people in Victoria who want her as their MP and are moving there in order to, to fulfill that. I think that we have seen Elizabeth uh, operate as a really strong voice for the environment in Parliament, and we expected that. Of all the lawyers in Parliament, she is the only one that I personally would trust the keys to the planet to. <laughs> it came as a big surprise to us, I think, though, how the current government, the current administration, has when it took full majority power, started to attack the very grounds of its own legitimacy by taking away our democratic rights. And I think that at least most of you will agree with me that over the last few years, there has only been one clear voice in Parliament that has actually held the government to account and shame the opposition by their inability to be effective. <clears throat> Elizabeth's voice on, voice on matters of democracy, on matters that are basic to getting any policy, environmental or not, passed through Parliament, have been crystal clear. And I am so happy to be able to introduce her to you tonight, talking about saving democracy from politics. <laughs> Uh, that's going to be coming my way. Uh, the, uh, the, actually, the story about my mom driving the paper down, uh, it was really quite fabulous. My, people who knew my this wasn't part of the talk. I, I apologize for this. I'm going to digress. <laughs> Those of you who know me are not surprised. Uh, <laughs> my mom set her land speed record that day. Uh, it was, um, my father referred to driving with my mother as flying air Stephanie. Uh, and she got from Sydney, Cape Breton, where we were in the court case, Washington, and, and the thing that instigated her drives was the, I had teams of, we had teams of lawyers, and I was both a plaintiff, oh, not both, all of the above, plaintiff in the case, fundraiser, law clerk working for the people I hired while I raised money to pay them, media spokesperson. It was the toughest period of my life. This business of being an MP is a picnic compared to what it was like to fight Agent Orange in the Nova Scotia courts, where the judge ended up ruling that uh, Agent Orange was safe, had never caused any damage in Vietnam or anywhere else that he looked. So it was a really spectacularly horrible experience. But what had happened that morning, well, the day of my graduation from law school, the lawyers looked up at each other and said, hey, if we can get Elizabeth articled before the cross-examination of Dr. Norris, she could do it, because I prepared all the cross-examination questions. And on this cross-examination, oh, God, it was glorious. The Environmental Protection Agency of the U.S. government had given me the notes that they had wanted to use to cross-examine this so-called expert on the fate and persistence of 245T in soils. 
and water that they never got to use to cross-examine them because Dow and the U.S. government had reached out for a settlement. So here we were, this upstart, hopelessly underfunded, grassroots civil litigation against Agent Orange. And I'd been given the entire file that proved that his samples in the field had shown, and for those of you who follow environmental issues, and most of you in this room do, showed that 245T had been persistent and reached levels of a couple meters down. But his published reports only showed six inches and disappeared soon. So I had his field notes. How do I have this? It was just a miracle. So they looked at each other. They were both pretty bagged. And they said, boy, we could get Elizabeth's papers filed in time for the cross-examination. Mm -hmm. And I said, let me go. I can do it. <laughs> <laughs> That's what she's, like it was, and then she said, um, since I'm in Halifax anyway, is there anything you want me to do? <laughs> and I said, yeah, go to my graduation. Can you pick up my diploma while you're there? <laughs> she said, sure. So all my friends would see my mom and say, oh, did Elizabeth get her? No, no, she's cross-examining the ex-witness up there. Anyway, it's a longer story than I care to share, but uh, it was, uh, it was, that was the worst, actually, that, that court case, fighting Agent Orange in the Nova Scotia courts. The good news was, by the time the judge ruled they were safe, even though the completely horrifically negligent government of Canada never banned 245T, never took any regulatory action against Agent Orange. They kept saying it was safe right at the moment. You couldn't buy it anywhere in the world because the U.S. government and Dow Chemical reached an agreement that Dow would stop exporting their old stock. But for that, the government of Canada, on the record, right up to the last minute, continued to say that it was bad science in the U.S. that it was never banned. This is one of the reasons I take things from Health Canada with a grain of salt. Actually, given their position on salt, I take it with a lot of salt. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I wanted to do this tour because my greatest fear, and you know what, my greatest fear when I decided to run for leader of the Green Party was that Stephen Harper would get a majority government mm -hmm. and destroy everything that we've worked for for decades. But since I've gotten into the role of being in politics, I have a bigger fear, which is that the most damaging things that are happening to our democracy are unseen and unmentioned and unknown by the Canadian public and therefore will not be fixed after Stephen Harper goes. So I'm committed to trying to explain a lot of things to a lot of Canadians and in the 2015 election. So when Stephen Harper decided not to resume Parliament this week on September 16th, I thought, oh well, good thing to do to October 16th is try to see as many people as I can and explain this and see if any of it takes hold. Because democracy in this country, sometimes they the Monty Python, it's the dead parrot. <laughs> democracy in this country is nailed to its perch, you can see it. There is democracy, don't tell us it's dead parrot. But it ceased to be. Now, that will sound dr dramatic and unfair and even radical. We get to vote, don't we? And isn't that the essence of a democracy that we get to vote? But what's happened over a period of years is that we've transited from Westminster parliamentary democracy, which the fundamental principles are the, the supremacy of Parliament, the Prime Minister reports to Parliament, not vice versa, that decisions are made by members of Parliament acting on behalf of their constituents, another fundamental principle, and that evidence-based decision-making is developed through a professional public service which in a non-partisan fashion provides advice to a political side of government apparatus which may or may not decide to use that public policy advice. That's been our system of government for a very long time. And as Donald mentioned, by the way, I should mention, I think everybody knows that Donald Galloway was the Green Party candidate in last November's Victoria by-election, very nearly my seatmate in Parliament, something I hope we can rectify because I do need him. But uh, spectacular campaign and a wonderful human being. But Don as Donald mentioned, I worked in Ottawa in the Mulroney government. So I'm hardly very partisan. Uh, at the time that the Minister of Environment asked me to come work for him, um, being a progressive conservative, and he really was putting pressure on me, and I said, you really don't want me. I'm sure you don't want me in your office, because I'm the kind of person who would quit on principle. He said, we know that. Everyone knows that. That's why it'd be so great to have you in my office, because everyone would know you're the kind of person who would quit on principle. And then I said to him, well, you know, you do know I'm not a progressive conservative. And he said, I, I, I didn't think you were. <laughs> But then he said, you're not anything else either, are you? I said, no, I'm not anything else. I, you know, whatever. I just don't, you know. But going to work in his office was, thank God I had that chance. 
because I have institutional memory of what Parliament was like when it was a democracy. My colleagues in Parliament don't. They don't know anything about it. I sit down with conservative MPs and say, it used to be different, you know. There used to be cooperation in parliamentary committees. Really? I said, yes, in committees on legislation. So those of you who are sitting down would know this. You won't fall down and need to sit down. Parliament passes legislation which over the last, well, since 1867, any bill entered in the Canadian Parliament at first reading would be altered by the time it got through second reading, going to committee, coming back at report stage, third reading, and then it goes to the Senate, and then it comes back if they make changes, and then it goes to the Governor General for Royal Assent. Bills have drafting errors. Bills can be approved by nonpartisan, cross-party cooperation in the various committees that examine statutes. And having been a member of the minister's staff, I, I worked line by line. I was the only member of his staff who actually did environmental work, so I did all the files. Mm -hmm. And the rest of the people in the office paid attention to the political stuff. Mm -hmm. So I did, I did clause by clause English and French review of, before first reading for the Canadian Environmental Protection Act so we'd get it right. And when it went to the Committee on Environment, an opposition member said, you know, this bill would be a lot better if we kick-started the registration of toxic substances with a priority substances list so it doesn't take so long to start listing the ones we know are toxic. Because it wasn't a great regime, I've got to admit, it, was a, it still is. Substance by substance registration. But when I went to the committee and this suggestion came forward as an amendment, I thought, fantastic. And I went back to Tom McMillan and I said, what do you think? He said, oh, that's a great idea. So that, those amendments all carried. The bill was fundamentally redrafted to accommodate really good ideas from liberals and New Democrats. And it wasn't unusual that that happened. That was what was normal. That was what was normal. What's happening right now in Parliament, and when, as I say, when I explain this to my colleagues, they're surprised. Are you really? I said, oh yeah, in committees, amendments used to be accepted from opposition members. Since I've been elected, there's almost not, a, there's, very rarely any bill that has any significant alteration from first reading to Royal Assent. Bill C-38, all 440 pages of it, the omnibus budget bill, changing, amending, repealing, gutting, 70 different laws, did not have one single comma changed from first reading to Royal Assent. Because Stephen Harper, unique in all Canadian history, regards every legislative process, every parliamentary tradition, as a partisan battleground in which he will not yield an inch. So even drafting errors, once discovered, could not be fixed. Drafting errors in Bill C-38 in the spring of 2012 were corrected in Bill C-45 in the fall. But he wasn't prepared to correct or admit. Sort of, it's sort of like a Greek myth kind of persona. Like, you know, that, that, that wisdom comes fully fledged and perfect from his brow, and there's no <laughs> point in imagining that it's less than perfect. Well, today I was talking to a grade 11 social studies class at Parkland High School, up in my riding in Sydney, and talking to them about democracy, and talking about government, and going through some of the basic concepts. So I know you know the basic concepts, but on the other hand, when one has the audacity to run across the country, with a tour called Rescue Democracy from Politics, I think it requires some explanation. So the first thing we need to do is say, what do I mean by politics? I don't mean the kind of small p political activism that many of us in this room, my friend Vicki Husband over there being a past master at it, where we use the political process to protect forests. I'm not trying to save democracy from that kind of political action. That's what citizens who are engaged and effective do. In this context, I'm using the term politics to mean hyper-partisanship, mindless partisanship, that at all times and on all issues votes down the party line and never considers the national interest. That's what's killing democracy in Canada. So democracy itself, what is democracy? Well, we can go back to the ancient Greeks, so we've had it around for a while, but I think in essence it's still an experiment. Winston Churchill said, you know, it's the worst possible system except all the rest. It, it's a hard and mucky process to have a democracy that works. And it very easily slips through your fingers. Democracy is tricky. 
Now, if you go back to ancient Athens and Pericles, is that a man who does not participate in the city, as of course in ancient Greek democracies, I mean, they, they were flawed, let's face it, only the men could vote, slaves couldn't vote, women couldn't vote. But a man who does not participate in the city, we do not think lives at all. So our concepts of democracy at their purest are about who we are as a people, how we express our collective will to make the world a better place, recognizing that in the absence of the state or of a democracy and government that flows from it, we really can't function very well. It, it isn't practical for each one of us to pave the bit of road in front of our house and hope that our neighbors do the same. It isn't practical for us to just open up random, you know, well, it is practical to home school your children, but if you're going to try to run a good educational system, you need to have the state run public education and make sure every child is educated. You need waterworks, you need mass transit. There are many, many, there's a myriad of things that you need to do collectively. So in essence, if you go back to kind of the British, you know, so I'm going to move very fast from ancient Greece to John Locke and liberal British principles of democracy. The state doesn't exist in some kind of abstract, absolute, neither do governments. The principle under which we've all lived and, in which, and within which Westminster parliamentary democracy has evolved, see, basically Westminster parliamentary democracy in some ways was created on the field at Runnymede when the, the nobles basically handed the king his head. Well, he actually didn't be headed. They just said, look, enough of this making up all your decisions without consulting us. We may be commoners, but you better talk to us about it. And that's why I'm a member of the House of Commons. It's all the commoners who said, you've got to consult us. So over time, it evolved and evolved and evolved. So go to John Locke, and the, the fundamental precept here is that government exists by consent of the government. That we're engaged, we're involved, <coughs> citizens control what goes on through their government, and otherwise, a government that ignores the consent of the government is illegitimate. It becomes an illegitimate government. <coughs> now, thanks to my daughter and a, and a friend who thought I could, should read Foucault, I've been reading The Birth of Biopolitics. I love this one, but it, it's a good one. The greatest evil of government, this is um, Michel Foucault, whose essays are brilliant. Anyway, the greatest evil of government, what makes it a bad government? It's not that the prince is wicked, but that he is ignorant. Now, of what would he be ignorant to have bad government? And Foucault's view is being ignorant of the fundamental principles of the natural laws that give legitimacy to government. In other words, in a democracy, you have to understand that you, you're only able to govern by consent of the governed, and that there are limits on the exercise of power. Now, this is where democracy is in real trouble. And democracy is in real trouble, according to Peter Russell, professor emeritus at the University of Toronto, and a wonderful advocate for Westminster parliamentary democracy and our traditions and the supremacy of parliament. Democracy is in trouble because of the rise of well-organized, well-financed political parties. And the rapid rise of total and absolute control within those political parties by the leader. So, obviously, I am the leader of a federal political party. But because the Green Party is very committed to grassroots democracy, the internal governance documents of the Green Party constrain whatever powers I might be able to exercise if I was relying, say, for instance, just on the Elections Act. The Elections Act says that every leader of every politi political party must sign the nomination papers for every candidate. This was a benign change to the Elections Act made in the late 60s when they decided for the first time, I mean, this is how little political parties matter. You know, in 1867, Sir John A. Macdonald referred to his caucus, or actually after 1867, when he was prime minister in his first term, he referred to his caucus as loose fish. <laughs> they were moving around all over the place. And no leader of a party, and no prime minister of any party in this country had any legal, certainly not under federal law, powers to punish and coerce candidates and members of parliament until the Elections Act changed to say leaders have to sign the nomination papers. The reason for the change was this, that the, uh, all these years from 1867 till the 19, late 1960s, when you went to vote in Canada, your, our ballots just had the names of the candidates, never referenced their political parties. 
mean, political parties didn't emerge. They didn't have political parties in ancient Greece. They're not an essential part of democracy. Didn't have them in Britain until the latter part of the 19th century, and they were very loose then. John Stuart Mill's treatise on democracy never mentioned political parties. So then this, you know, I know talking about something as recent as being the last hundred years doesn't sound all that recent. But we talk about a concept of democracy that, that is from ancient Greece. Political parties are pretty recent. But they're gradually accumulating under themselves a great deal of power, and the power of political parties is as nothing compared to the power of the leaders. And that brings us to the problem of top-down control within every party in this country, except the Greens, uh, over every single thing an MP does. Now, I've been aware of how, as I said, I, I saw how Parliament worked when I worked in the Moroni government. It wasn't like that then. Uh, my boss, as Minister of Environment, wrote, we, we, we co-wrote speeches, basically. He'd tell me what he wanted, we'd write them together, and he'd be sometimes making changes on his way to the podium. I tell current members of Parliament this, and they're stunned. Because these days, the Minister of the Crown can't make a single speech that isn't pre-approved by the Prime Minister's office. Neither can a backbencher stand up and make a speech in the House. Not only do they have to get it approved, it's written for them by somebody else. They're all written in PMO. That's one of the things I love about my job as the only Green Party member in the House of Commons, is that I dare not leave for a minute or they'll get up to something. <laughs> so, I'm there all the time, which means that I alone notice when they repeat whole paragraphs the same, not because of their literary merit or because they're eloquent and, and fantastic pieces of discourse. So they're, they're cut and paste blather out of PMO that, that over and over and over again get repeated because they're handed speeches to give and the people in PMO who are cranking this out are sure nobody's listening. So they don't mind having Peter Kent and Joe Oliver repeat the same paragraph and then handing it off to Andrew Saxton from Vancouver and hoping John Weston won't notice when he has to read the same thing. <laughs> Nobody notices except me and then I look at this stuff and say, ah, they're all reading the same cut and paste. They must be in a hurry. They're not even taking the time to pretend to write new speeches for these guys. We did an interesting panel on democracy Tuesday night in Halifax. It was a fantastic panel. It was actually put together by Dalhousie University students. And it included Brett Rathgaver, a member of Parliament for Edmonton, who recently decided he had it, with being a member of Mr. Harper's caucus, and on his own, quit, crossed the floor, and sits, sits as an independent. And it also included the former liberal leader for the province of Nova Scotia, a wonderful guy named Danny Graham, and the former NDP finance minister for Nova Scotia, Graham Steele. So that was the panel. And Danny Graham told a story that so resonated. Now, he'd gone to Ottawa to work in the Cretan government as a, oh, Cretan government. Forgive me, that's a sin, an unpardonable sin, Cretan administration. <laughs> Stephen Harper wants us all to call it the Harper government. Repeat after me, there is no such thing as the Harper government. <laughs> There's no such thing as the Harper government. <laughs> it is the people's government. I'm a Canada. member of parliament and part of the government. Harper has an administration. So in the Cretan administration, Danny Graham went to Ottawa as a young lawyer and was working in something that he found fairly offensive, which was the post-9-11 new terror anti-terrorism laws, which impinge on civil rights and civil liberties. So he wasn't very happy about his mission, but he became less happy with it when he had to prepare all the speeches and run around and hand them out. So he felt like he was a delivery boy, a messenger, handing speeches to members of parliament for them to read. And then he realized that any grade 12 student could read these speeches. They'd know no more about the issue than the members of Parliament who were reading. Now that was in the Cretan era. Under Stephen Harper, it's gotten much worse. So I thought I'd compare something. In, in, my, in my last book, I'm working on a new book too, which is sort of I'm trying. You're my focus group for the new book. But anyway, um, I, this was just the last book was before I got elected but after I become leader of the Green Party. So I was being exposed to a lot of politics. It was after the 2008 election. But what I talked about, just a brief sentence, was the creation of a presidential prime minister, the increasing weakness of any real cabinet system, and the impotence of members of parliament all point to a serious risk for the health of our democracy. Since I wrote that, I've realized it's much, much worse, and in fact, it's become much worse since Stephen Harper got a majority. So I thought I'd share with you some words from a, a, a really brilliant 
and thoroughly decent person from political <coughs> life who just had retired as a, uh, from the Senate because he reached the critical age of 75. But his name's Lowell Murray. I first knew him when he was in the Prime Minister's office with Brian Mulroney. Uh, you know, you'll know I'm prejudiced in his favor because he's from Cape Breton. But he, he's a, still, to this day, a progressive conservative. He never joined Mr. Harper's party. This is from a column he wrote in the Globe, was published in the Globe and Mail September 11th of this year. And when he put in quotes, the Harper government's trademark innovation, and then in brackets, literally, he's literally trying to trademark the government as the Harper government, has been to superimpose on this existing centralized system, where he refers to the gathering of power in PMO, a tightly run communications regime within which message control is the very essence of governance. Under this system, even strong ministers often become passengers on their own departmental ships, their destination and course set by remote control from Message Central, capital M, capital C, at PCO PMO. Parliament is not even in the picture. At its worst, the system makes ciphers of ministers reducing from substantive to symbolic the autonomy, authority, and accountability they should exercise. He knows what's happening. I see it happening. But there are so few voices speaking to the threat to Canadian democracy. And the fact that Stephen Harper is systematically launching an assault on every single institution of Parliament. Prime Minister's Office, going back to that notion, the Prime Minister's <coughs> Office is never referenced in the Canadian Constitution. It's right up there with political parties. Don't mention them in the Constitution. We don't need them. As a matter of fact, in doing research for this last book, had the wanted to figure out exactly what was the Prime Minister's office before Pierre Trudeau decided that there should be something that got capital PMO initials. Under Lester Pearson, it was a, uh, described by Tom Kent, who was uh, Pearson's principal secretary, as a few secretaries and a handful of stenographers. It's now a $10 million a year operation with zero transparency. I can't even find out how many people work there. And it's all dedicated to partisanship, re-electing the current prime minister and his party, or her party. So going back to, to what happened with this growth of power in the PMO, Pierre Trudeau's initial idea wasn't uh, in any way more than light management. It wasn't to create a power base for the prime minister and undermine Westminster parliamentary democracy. It's just morphed that way. What Trudeau found when he first became Prime Minister was what a funny system this is. The Minister of Justice and the Minister of Health can both decide to make a major policy announcement on the same day, and nobody knows ahead of time that they might clash in the media. So Trudeau, thinking about, okay, this is an age where media matters, let's, let's just you know, get a little bit of coordination here. Uh, speaking of that Minister of Justice, John Turner, when he was Minister of Justice, encountered one of the new people hired by Trudeau as he began to centralize control in the Prime Minister's office. It was a young Tom Axworthy, who's now a great advocate for democracy working at Queen's University. Mm -hmm. And uh, Tom Axworthy went back to PMO, sort of the tail between his legs, because John Turner told him, you go back and tell the boss, I don't need some junior G-man from the PMO Ooh. showing up and telling me what to do. <laughs> now, if you compare, as Tom Axworthy commented when he told me this anecdote, what's going on now to what's going on then, they had light management. I know friends in the Conservative Caucus who refer to PMO as the Gestapo. They also call it the guys in short pants. They're sick of it. They're sick of being bullied. They're sick of being told, show up at this time. Read the cue card we've given you. Read the speech we've given you. You're not allowed to make that speech you want to make. You have to make this speech we want you to make. You're not allowed to say that on behalf of your constituents. Because today we want you to launch an attack on the NDP and the job killing carbon tax. There's this crazy little, tiny little political opportunity for every member of parliament. It rotates between 2 o'clock in the afternoon and 2.15 when the question period starts. 15 members of parliament are given the grand total of 60 seconds to say something of their own craft. The tradition has been to stand up and say, I'm pleased, Mr. Speaker, to announce today that in Cumberland, Colchester, Muscadabit Valley, citizens have gathered 
to bear witness to the loss of one of our greatest citizens. Mayor Blow just passed away, and we want to just reference today how many people in Truro will miss Mayor Blow. 60 seconds, that's all you get. Increasingly, PMO is telling all the conservative operatives, MPs, that they have to read things about Christmas is coming, and we know everyone's going to want to run out and buy Christmas lights and tinsel and prepare for the festive season, but if those NDP get their way, they will have a job-killing carbon tax, and all those Christmas lights will cost more. <laughs> <laughs> statement after statement after statement. And then the NDP decide not to be outgunned, so they started making their members of parliament read ridiculous things back. Mark Wara from Langley, BC, is a conservative member of parliament. We don't agree on much, but we agree about democracy. He had his 60 seconds. He was going to say something this spring. No one knows what it was he was going to say. Because right before he got up to say it, his party whip, Gordon O'Connor, said he wasn't allowed to speak. And they pulled his spot and gave it to somebody else. They didn't like the content of his message. Before you get too freaked out on how awful the conservatives are, the NDP did the same thing to Bruce Hart. So Mark Warra did something very unusual. He was so angry about it that a few days later, and he certainly did a good job with this. He made a point of personal privilege, which is like the point of order, but about his own role in Parliament. Point of personal privilege to the Speaker, that surely he had the right of free speech. That in his one little 60 second moment that rotates to him probably once every four months, he wanted to be able to say something that he knew his constituents would have, would, that his constituents would want to say. And he'd been denied this by the party whip my amazement because I'm there all the time. There were very, there were very few people, I, you've probably heard this from me before, those of you who come to any town halls in Sacramento House, that one reason I love my job is that it isn't what you think it is. If you only watch question period, which most people think is parliament, and imagine that that was my life for 10 hours a day, you, you, you'd imagine that I wouldn't enjoy it at all. <laughs> but that's the only bad hour. Because the rest of the time, there's nobody there. <laughs> <laughs> Most of the time, there's not quorum. Now, if I decide to call for quorum, which I do now and then, but it really is sort of pointless. The first time I did it, Denise Savoy was in the chair as deputy speaker. And I love Denise. I miss Denise in the House. But anyway, Denise, I, I didn't know what happened. It seemed to me that when there are only two conservatives in the House, and they're the majority, that there's a lack of quorum. <laughs> so in point of order, Madam Speaker, do we have quorum? And the strangest thing happened. Denise went absolutely still, like a statue, and didn't breathe a word, didn't uh -huh. say anything. And I thought, what gives, you know? And then it took a while, but suddenly you heard a little, little scurrying sound. And suddenly, from the doors and back, the conservative members of parliament started running towards their desks, and Andy Pierce came out of their doors, and everybody scurried to their place. It took about four minutes, five minutes, I don't know. Finally, she said, yes, we have quorum. <laughs> and I realized that if you were reading Hansard, the record of the house, you'd think that Saanich Gulf Islands green lady can't even count. What a, why did she ask for a quorum call when the speaker, because you don't see a lapsed time on the page. You say, Madam Speaker, do we have quorum? Yes, we have quorum. So I don't, I don't really like to do it very much anymore because the other thing that happened as soon as she said yes we have quorum is they all got up and left again. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, the day Mark Laura started to make a, a, a statement of personal privilege that his rights of free speech had been infringed, I have this wonderful way of reaching the Canadian public right away. I started tweeting because the media followed me on Twitter so people would notice because otherwise who's going to notice? There's nobody there. Mark Laura is saying that the conservative whip shut him down and it violated his rights of free speech. It was stunning. As soon as he finished, another conservative got up, Leon Benoit from Alberta. He said, I want to support the member for Langley. Surely we have the right of free speech. In total, nine conservative MPs stood up to support Mark Warren's right to free speech. The interesting response from Gordon O'Connor, which I want to share because it's why we have to rescue democracy from politics, was this. Now, Mr. Speaker, member for Langley is part of a team. And you're like the umpire. 
you're there to tell us if we're offside. You know, you're here to watch how the score goes. Make sure we, you know, if we're in the penalty box, you're the one you can figure out. You're the umpire. But remember, for Langley wants you to get down off your empire bench, come into the dugout, pick what players I'm going to put out there on the ice. I spent so long saying democracy is not a sport. <laughs> and here is the government whip, Gordon O'Connor, making the case that the speaker has no role in deciding who gets to speak. Because he's like the umpire at a sporting match, and it's up to the whip to figure out who gets to speak and who doesn't. Now, it was a small victory for democracy when the Speaker of the House ruled. I, I, you won't be surprised. I got up and pointed out more or less what I just said. It's not a sport. <laughs> this is a democracy. We are here on behalf of our constituents. We do not get elected to come here to work for our political party. And they have, the political party has no business telling a member of parliament when they can and can't speak. Well, the Speaker ruled that pretty much. Unfortunately, he went on to say that in this case, Mark Lara had not attempted to speak and accepted his being told to sit down, and therefore there was no violation of privilege. If they found a violation of privilege, it would have taken the matter farther. But Speaker Shear then said, any member of Parliament is free to try to catch my eye any time. It turns out that the tradition of the Speaker receiving a list of names of who's going to be recognized that day from each of the party whips started from, and so many of these things start innocently, and then they turn kind of ugly fast, but uh, Jean Sauvé, when she was Speaker of the House, claimed that she had trouble seeing who everybody was <laughs> back there, and the members were standing up and trying to get her attention, so she said, well, if you could just give me a list, so I know in what order you intend to go through question period. And that list then became an entitlement of the whip to control the emperor's member's problem. So I stand up all the time now, and I always stood up all the time in the rest of the day, but now I try during question period and everything else. But the interesting thing about this story, to the extent, how many of you ever heard about Mark Barr's attempt to say that he lost freedom of speech? Okay. How many of you ever heard how he was punished afterwards? As little media attention as there was on this blow for democracy, and as much as the news media in this country mischaracterized the movement of MPs in the conservative ranks who stood up with him as social conservatives who wanted to get rid of abortion rights. They said that was the whole issue and all the people who stood up with him, that was their issue. In fact, a number of the conservatives who spoke in favor of Mark Warren's rights to free speech are people who agree with the rest of us, I assume, at least with me, that, there, that we can accept no climb downs, no reduction on a woman's right to a safe and legal abortion. People like John Williamson from New Brunswick, people like Michael Chong from Ontario, <coughs> who support a woman's right to choose, were part of the group that was brave enough to stand up and support Mark Wara. Mm -hmm. So there was, the slight media coverage there was of Mark standing up for free speech was muddied by mischaracterizing what kind of movement was going on within the conservative ranks. And on top of that, they didn't bother at all to cover what happened afterwards. He'd been chair of the Environment Committee for the last at least four years. He lost his chairmanship of the committee. And he certainly isn't going to be cabinet material. The cabinet shuffle that Stephen Harper orchestrated this summer was a direct message to any conservative in the ranks of backbench who thought that they could stand up for democracy. There were a number of other moments. I won't go into all of them. But it was very clear that by keeping Peter Van Loan in place as government house leader, Stephen Harper is making sure that any backbencher who thinks they have the right of free speech is going to know that they just got a uh, poke in the eye with a sharp stick. So the many ways in which democracy is in trouble in this country, and I'll just try to run through them systematically. My major message, if you can, and I'll go to questions fairly soon, but the major effort of this tour is to try to persuade Canadians that what's happening is systematic and dangerous and won't end at the end of Harper's reign. Uh, and I use the term reign appropriately. Um, Ned Franks, who's a professor emeritus of political science at Queen's University, said at the time of Stephen Harper's second prorogation that we should now officially re refer to him as King Stephen I of Canada. <laughs> but if we don't understand how he has systematically undercut the institutions of Parliament, and ancillary traditions of Westminster parliamentary democracy, all hail King Justin, King Tom. It's not acceptable. You have to understand what he's done so it can be fixed, and the media isn't covering it. 
not, not for a moment to suggest that the other parties don't have better policies, but it's a very serious matter when a country like Canada loses our parliamentary tradition, has a prime minister who keeps and withholds documents from parliament with no consequences. Remember the Afghan detainee documents and how Speaker Milliken ruled that it was contempt of parliament to refuse to release those documents to parliamentarians on request. And a committee was struck. And then we had an election. And none of those documents, the full, the, all of the documents on the Afghan detainee scandal have never been conveyed to parliament, only a very small number. And the issue became sort of old news, so we move on. Contempt of parliament under Stephen Harper is a daily matter. Kevin Page, Parliamentary Budget Officer, made the case also at UVic, speaking at a Green event, but anywhere you can hear Kevin Page, he's brilliant and such a good and dedicated public servant, that we no longer respected the principle that the Parliament controls the public purse. Parliament must have access to all the information that goes into developing a budget. Parliament must actually see a budget. And parliamentarians have the right to know what the impact is of cuts when they take place. So Kevin Page, as a, an instrument of parliament, went to court to make the case that we had a right as MPs, and he had a right as Parliament's budget officer, to get documentation from each deputy minister of the impact of the cuts that were happening in their departments. And the court said, you have that right. And Kevin Page has been replaced by a new parliamentary budget officer, but she's saying the same thing. Hand over the evidence of what the cuts have done in each of your departments. And all the deputy ministers are refusing. Because they've been told to refuse, not by the clerk of the Privy Council, to whom they used to report, but by the Prime Minister's office for partisan reasons. The numbers of things that we should have a chance to debate and discuss and about which parliament should be consulted is an almost endless list. The impact of cuts even the budget document itself, the 2013 budget, and you can find it online if you want to verify this and compare it to previous budgets, the budget documents, well, this is going to be sort of tautological, you would expect this, the budget documents used to include the budget. <laughs> it's now a very thick public relations document about the jobs, growth, and economy strategy. There are numbers, but they're in isolation. So you can't tell when they say, we're going to give $48 million this year to be a rail, or there's going to be $429 million over the next five years to approve meteorological services. You can't tell, so does the budget of the department overall go up because that money's just been announced? Or are there cuts somewhere else that bring it down? And what is that money really going to be spent on? In every previous budget, and I've read budgets since I was at Sierra Club for years, I've gone into, well, Stephen Harper doesn't allow non-government organizations and environmental groups any longer to go into the lockups, but we used to, development groups, women's groups, public policy groups of all kinds, used to be able to go in to a lockup, read the budget when it was still private, so that you could digest it, so you'd have something to say to the media at the moment that the finance minister stood up to deliver a budget and it became public. And in all those years, I got pretty good at speed reading budgets. And I'd always start at the back. Because the back was where you found the summary of this is what Environment Canada is going to get, this is what SEED is going to get, this is what each department, and often and usually with a projection for the next three years. So this year's budget, the 2013 budget, doesn't have those tables. They're not included at all. You have to wait for the main estimates for those, and we pass the main estimates with this sort of speed process that never really comes before the House. That's contempt of Parliament. Stephen Harper is the Member of Parliament for Calgary Southwest. By virtue of the fact that he was elected leader of the Conservative Party, and they won the most seats, despite our dysfunctional voting system with only 39% of the vote, we don't elect a Prime Minister. He's not an Emperor. He's not King. It chafes at him that he's not. I'll tell you the following things that have happened on Parliament. Again, institutional memory is really a, a gift I've been given that because I worked in government in the 1980s. I remember how things used to be. One of the things used to be the heads of state were met at Rideau Hall by our head of state, the Governor General. Now, this is all procedural and pomp and circumstance, and the media doesn't seem to notice. Now, and for a while, Stephen Harper, there was, there was actually a, fa a freedom of information 
document the media got hold of, that he was spending millions of dollars in planning to take over the former U.S. Embassy, which is right across the street from Parliament, oh, yeah. and turn it into a ceremonial greeting area, because he minds that, you know, if you go to the U.S., Barack Obama gets to greet you to the White House, and it's quite big and impressive. <laughs> well, he wanted to turn that building into a greeting area for heads of state, mm -hmm. replacing the, you know, ceremonial Governor General. What happens now, since he didn't get away with that, is that every time a head of state shows up in Ottawa, they roll out red carpets all the way up the stairs of Center Block and down across the Peace Tower. When Netanyahu came, they brought up tanks. <laughs> and they fired a 21 gun salute that shook the whole House of Commons. But we're all there as commoners while the king goes out and greets the visiting dignitaries. He skips Parliament to have these ceremonial flags all over the place, podiums set up in the, in the rotunda, because he wants to be seen as the head of state. In a, in a ceremonial Canada Day event, and only Susan Delacourt from the Toronto Star covered this, he managed to make Mikhail Jean wait so he could accept the 21-gun salute. And he goes by reviewing the troops, and he has people salute to him. No one should salute Stephen Harper. He's not, he's not the, uh, he's not, more than what he is. I mean, I'm not taking anything away from the fact that he's prime minister. But Cretin, Mulroney, I mean, you can imagine Mulroney might have had imperial tendencies, but <laughs> this is breathtaking stuff and no one's noticing it. So, in a nutshell, Stephen Harper is systematically destroying our ability to have evidence-based decision-making. He's destroying those institutions that used to collect the evidence. He's muzzling those people who have the evidence. He's steadily transforming Parliament into a symbolic sideshow while all decisions are made in his office by himself. His cabinet members don't know what's going on within their departments, as Lil Murray pointed out, and as I see every day when I go ask them questions privately, try to find out if they know what's going on with the question. The destruction of Westminster parliamentary democracy is a huge threat. We can put somebody different in PMO and hopefully we have somebody different who cared about climate action. But if we leave these institutions unchanged, one side effect is that Canadians don't care about voting anymore because people can see something feels wrong about this picture. Where is the consent of the government? Where is the legitimacy for a government? If there is no sense that you are personally, intimately involved in the decisions that your member of parliament makes on your behalf, if you recognize, and Brett Rathgaber made this point the other night in Halifax, that the Parliament of Canada is essentially becoming a, a version of the U.S. Electoral College. All the votes are claimed by whoever wanted to vote for that party. And he said the Electoral College doesn't get summoned uh, for a you know, hundred some days of every year to waste everybody's time making preordained decisions. Parliament isn't supposed to function like that. Members of Parliament need to represent their constituents. To the extent that they take instructions from political parties, it should be lightly and not always. Every single vote from every single day that I have served since I was elected, every single other member of parliament except for those who are independents are handed a sheet and told how to vote. All the parties, all the time. So, I want to open it up for questions. I'm sorry it took so long to sketch this out. But the fundamental issue is this. It's not Stephen Harper alone who's the problem. He is by far the most dictatorial and dangerous prime minister we've ever had. But the damage he's doing is not being covered in our media, which is not a problem. And if we're going to fix what he's broken, we have to be prepared to talk about why it's important to understand our traditions, to have engaged citizens, and to actually step up and say, I am not going to stand by while you, you steal democracy in plain sight. Thanks. <laughs>
I'll try and identify you by sticking your hand up. If you want to introduce yourself, that would be nice. And try and keep it brief. I'll try and keep her answers brief. Uh, which I may have less success than you. But uh, try and keep it short, because I'm sure there's a lot of people who, who want to uh, participate. Yes. Just a quick comment. Um, Elizabeth, thank you for being here. Uh, just a quick comment. Tomorrow at 12:30, we're having a solidarity march uh, at the campus. We're going to walk around campus, uh, mention the injustice of the group that we today, look at indigenous issues. So 12:30, so Davis Brown Building. Everyone's welcome. Students, community, faculty, whoever wants to join. We're going to walk around together and talk about these issues. Uh, the question for Elizabeth. Uh, I guess, what can we do? Uh, let's just say two things. Legally, as you mentioned, Stephen Harper is Muslim, his own MP. So basically, whoever voted for the MPs, that could be a human rights violation because if I vote for you and you're, you're my MP, you're supposed to represent me, yeah. if someone else is Muslim, you are just, you know, coercing you, is that a human rights violation? Can we legally, first through the court, and then if that doesn't work, through like a Canada wide class acting on behalf of the state, the class action laws are saying, even if you're more to the conservative MPs, these MPs are Muslim, which is a Bible, so human rights violation, is a human rights violation, what do we need to make that? That's a very innovative argument, but I think there's a lot of things we can do that are simpler. So first of all, if we made that argument, the problem we have in court is, number one, you have to have a, at least another conservative MP willing to say I've been Muslim, and, my, and therefore what my constituents want me to say is being prevented by being Muslim by someone. And there's we also have the problem. Wait, there's, there's evidence of being Muslim. Do they, like, can we send someone in just to investigate? So even yeah. if the concerns of peace say, you know what, he's not Muslim, he's concerned, you know, they, Yes, they're right, they're scared. Is there evidence of Yeah, there's lots, I mean, there's a lot of evidence of scientists being Muslim. And what, part of the problem, too, is that even when I talk to scientists who've already been fired, they're worried that, that they'll go after their pensions. This is, a, this is like, Stephen Harper's created a real atmosphere of fear and oppression throughout Ottawa and across this land in terms of people who work in the federal government. I think, you know, what we really, the easier thing to do is to actually fix some of these things structurally. It's, I have a private member's bill to remove the leader's signature on nomination papers. It's fairly straightforward. We could get something like that passed. But it's not the past No, but if, if we make it an election issue, if, so this is what I'm looking at. Is if we make an election issue of 2015, the leaders of parties and prime ministers have accumulated far too much power. But the prime minister's office shouldn't really exist. It certainly shouldn't be $10 million a year that's totally unaccountable. Uh, they're, they're really, a, it's a very... Um, what about being in charge? Like, sir, you've yeah. had a few <laughs> questions. <laughs> there are a yeah. lot of other okay. people. I guess we could put that last thing. Can we use the name charge right to say, mm -hmm. we have a bunch of Muslims, that's a crime. Is there something... And we can even say this is the time then you got to go for that. Yeah, well, but we Steve, like what's interesting is on, on, this, on this point, because like, I'm no longer practicing law and Donald's still teaching it, but this is another thing that Harper's done has shown complete contempt for court decisions. So in the case of uh, the court ruling, the Supreme Court counter ruling that we've been violating Omar Cotter's rights uh, in terms of charter rights and he's a Canadian citizen, they just basically ignored the rule. Uh, the, oh, by the way, I should mention another one of those issues that should have gone to Parliament and didn't is the Canada-China Investment Treaty. So looking at that court decision, the Hoop and Chesset First Nation is going to need a lot of help to do an appeal. So I mention that to you now because you'll probably be getting things in your inbox soon from people looking for donations to help them get an appeal. Because the, the uh, Canada-China Investment Treaty hasn't been ratified yet. But just to give you another flavor of what it's like to be a conservative MP, none of them knew anything about it either. <laughs> They're not consulted. They don't know ahead of time what Stephen Harper is about to announce. None of them were told in advance that he was going to announce in Europe that uh, changing pension from 65 to 67. So a lot of things that uh, make those people. And I think if you have friends who live in Rodings, held by conservative MPs as relatives, it's very helpful to encourage those people to go to those MPs and say, we would like to support you if you want to stand up more for your rights and not be pushed around by people in PMO. We need to actually, or maybe they should cross the floor and join Brent Rathgave or sitting as an independent. It's a, it's a very interesting thing that he did that. Okay, how about we make it a little bit more difficult for her? Uh, that I take a number of questions, oh and the, uh, we get them on the table, and then we'll allow uh, Elizabeth to answer them. 
just so that we can get uh, we we can get more participation. But this gentleman here, Bernard, and like thank you, Madam MP. I'm always amazed uh, at your work and the energy you exhibit. So thank you so much for your commendable. I think you are making a strong case of proportional representation, or perhaps you are saying when the minority government could bring the democracy back. I think one of the issues, structural issue, you can talk about is the mandatory voting is the one, because currently only 55% of the people vote, and Mr. Harper is governing with 35 to 40% of the votes from that 55. So I think those are the two or three ideas maybe you want to discuss. Uh, this topic isn't just in Ottawa, it's all in province as well. Um, and in fact, as far as I can tell, in the last 20 years, there's only been one political leader on any level that has seriously wanted to try and change things. And to say his name here probably going to be very popular. The trusted man is the only one that's trying to make a difference. But how do we possibly in Ottawa change things when, where you may not like Harper, the NDP's position has always been an MP or an MLA has no right to express their own opinion on anything unless the party has given them the approval to speak. They cannot ever speak. The party is fundamentally opposed to the idea of MPs or MLAs ever expressing opinions in parliaments on anything. And the Liberals, the Harper's only taken an actual extension of what first Trudeau and then French Yen created as the context. The arrogance of both Trudeau and French Yen is what Harper is just saying. We have three major political parties in Ottawa that have no constitutional interest in changing anything. And these are the same parties elsewhere. What do we do? Okay, that's number two. Number three? Uh, I, I, I want to thank you. I'm always thrilled to get your reports. And I have gone to the House and listened to question period. And it was just like watching the rock machine and the Hells Angels in suits. I <laughs> 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 was like, I was seeing it. But, but I, I wonder how much responsibility we, we all have ourselves for thinking we can vote every three years and you know, turn it all off. We couldn't leave our homes for four years and come back and think everything is going to be okay. You know, how do we get, how do we remind our MPs that they work for us and how do we let Harper know those are not your MPs, they're our MPs. How do we do that? How do we take it back? Because I think we've let it go a long way. Okay, answering those three, that's really great. You're right. We have to get rid of first past the post. Uh, now, I'm so, you know, it is true. Well, nationally, only 60% of Canadians voted in the 2011 election. The riding with the highest degree of voter turnout, the Sanders Gulf Islands, was 75% voter turnout. So that's just voting 
and that in addition to all the names on the ballots, there would be a box called None of the Above. I don't think you'd see higher voter turnout if people knew they had a chance like that, right? But Charles, Charles was Bill Strange, they didn't pass. Um, but we, we would do these things in the House for reforms. So if you're looking at reforms, by the way, I, I, there's three basic categories that need to be reformed. Parliamentary reform, like stop having legislative committees run as if they are partisan battles where you fight to the death to stop even sensible amendments. And so parliamentary reform of all kinds, getting rid of PMO, then electoral reform, get rid of the leader's signature, change the way we vote. That can be done through the House of Commons, you don't have to go for the Constitution. And the other key piece is citizen engagement. And that's a tough one. How do we engage citizens in realizing that we have to rescue democracy because nobody else is going to do it for us? Certainly not any of the other political party leaders because uh, as now moving on to your question about what the other parties do, Sad to say that the NDP have more party discipline in their voting record in the last two years than the Conservatives. There are occasionally Conservatives who go offside, they get punished, but the NDP vote down the line the same way on every issue as they are told to vote. And one of the saddest things that I experienced was uh, when I was the only member of Parliament to vote against bombing Libya, so many NDP, particularly women MPs, came up to me afterwards weeping. Because they were peace activists. They never thought in their whole life they'd get elected to Parliament and have to vote for aerial bombardment and know it was going to kill civilians. They just feel good. So the problems, as you say, are more than Stephen Harper. They're more than the conservatives at the federal level. The changes that are made, for instance, if you're right, in Nova Scotia, I was shocked when I found out that under Rodney McDonald, previous conservative member, premier of Nova Scotia, all deputy ministers were instructed to no longer report to their minister cabinet to the government, but to report directly to the Premier's office, centralizing control. Same thing in BC. Deputy ministers report to the Premier's office. Now, when the NDP came in in Nova Scotia under Darrell Dexter, they kept that system. Because it's handy to have all the leaders of power. Let's face it, most people who go into politics, particularly the people who want to be Premier and Prime Minister, kind of like the idea of having all the power. That's part of the DNA that makes them think they want to be. You know, really, what you need, you need in this situation, you need a hobbit to hold the ring. Question period. All and I can think is I am sorry. And what are we doing? You know, right now I would say, and I, I hate to use the word dictatorship too often because then it's easily exaggerated that I'm sort of calling Harper a dictator, and then by extension comparing him to all other dictators through history. These guys will grab anything I've said here tonight and take it out of context and beat me up with it forever. But it needs to be said that Stephen Harper's modus operandi is as a dictator. He has accumulated unto himself all the leaders of power to be an effective dictator. But we don't live in a dictatorship. We live in a democracy. So our current system can be described as a dictatorship interrupted by election. John Frechtian was described by Jeffrey Simpson as the benign dictatorship. If you were on the wrong side of Frechtian and you were in a liberal caucus, you didn't much feel it was benign. But the, 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 so our responsibility as citizens is to reassert some of these basic principles, like you don't govern without my consent. If this system is being perverted and distorted and contaminated by the toxicity of partisan politics at all times with such mindlessness, we are allowed as citizens to stand up and blow the whistle and say, your time's up. We're going to start only voting for MPs who tell us they're going to report to us. And we want you, when you go back into power, whoever the, maybe a coalition government at the end of the next election, whatever it is, we need enough Canadians to know what's going on so that they're elected with a commitment to take away the leader's signature on the nomination papers, to ensure that a caucus can institute a leadership review. Every other Westminster parliamentary democracy in the world has this, right? Margaret Thatcher was deposed by her own caucus. John Major replaced her with no election. Australia, well, it's like a revolving door there. For a <laughs> Kevin Rudd replaced by Julia Gillard, and then at the last minute, Kevin Rudd replaced Julia Gillard because in Westminster provincial tradition, we do not elect a prime minister. 
that Stephen Harper was able to tell them that the native people with a straight face without it causing people to race from their homes into the streets immediately, <coughs> that any attempt to have a coalition was an attempt by the opposition party to overturn the results of the election. Remember he said that. And the vast use of the media in this country let him get away with it. For the most part, very few. There were a few reality check interviews on Anna Maria Tremonti. But for the most part, a scandalously arrogant non-factual statement about our system of government was made by a sitting prime minister right before he shut down parliament in a move that was clearly unconstitutional. So from Westminster Parliamentary Democracy, it was invented <coughs> for nice people. It was invented for people who had respect for tradition and who wouldn't dream of abusing the power they'd been given. And so, if you let a really nice system, it's like, it's a very, it's, it, it, a ruthless individual can destroy Westminster parliamentary democracy without consequence, unless the citizens of the country stand up and say, you're not allowed to wreck our democracy. We didn't elect you here. <coughs> we didn't elect you at all. The only people who elected Stephen Harper are the voters of, of Calgary Southwest. Mm -hmm. And that's what we need to keep reminding people. Sorry. Okay. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I know that's that. Yeah. Okay. okay. I've got about I've got about seven. All right. Woo! The gentleman standing in the back is number one. The gentleman in the middle that's here is number two. There was somebody over there in the rugby shirt, number three. <laughs> then there's the yellow. Three at once. Three. Three at once. Three at once. Okay. So I'll everybody sure. else, keep your sure. hand up, sure. and, but these three can go. Thank you. Hi, Elizabeth. Uh, Matt Stoddard. We are Change Victoria. Um, first of all, I'd like to say thank you very much for having this open forum. I think uh, a lot of the things you touched on, this kind of situation, it is incredibly important. Um, just to go off from your party platform, you have a, something on there that's a section referring to real citizen power in a true democracy. And I really like that statement because I think that's what's going to win everything back for the people is to make us feel like we have some kind of power in this system and I think that's what's going to bring the voters back to the polls but to go to my question my question is uh, would the Green Party table support and promote a bill calling for legislation that would require MPs to be legally accountable for consulting with determining the views of and voting on the policy in accordance with the wishes of the constituents they were elected to represent because currently and I cite proceedings taken in the Court of Queen's Bench Law Courts in Wetaskiwin, Alberta where the court ruled that there was no legal duty of an elected representative at any level of government to consult with his constituents or determine their views. While such an obligation may generally be considered desirable, there is no legal requirement. And I just did a really quick little poll of some people on my way in here today, and I can tell you that I got a 96% response that yes, this is something, this is the kind of bill we need to table to start making some of these legislative MPs accountable for the actions that they're taking. Can I just add that when you asked me, I said no, but you wrote down yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I have two at no. Okay. You're one of them. That's number one. Number two. Thank you. Uh, uh, I'm a, my name is Ted Von Lovitz. I'm a refugee from Calgary West, Rob Anderson. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, I wanted to ask about the fear factor. You mentioned that people are fearful for him, and, uh, uh, fearful of him. And putting it into context, Chris Hedges writes about a system of government that's kind of being imposed slowly, well, over 30 years, called inverted totalitarianism. Essentially, looks like a uh, democracy, smells like it, but really isn't. Is Stephen Harper also fearful of the fact that somebody might ask an unfiltered question? I mean, that, that must be an aspect that must be driving him to isolate himself from ordinary Canadians and, and media, uh, you know, as a consequence is that questions to him are usually filtered in the middle of it. And then number three was uh, Justin there. Yeah. Hey, Elizabeth, that's many. Uh, one of your voters. Um, <laughs> it's a crazy question. So basically it is, just uh, please gently tell me how crazy. Um, <laughs> Harper does not accept the idea of a loyal opposition. And that's essential to democracy. Mm -hmm. And going through many of the steps that, uh, I'm guessing, 
that finally goes through in question period and in committee process. It assumes that opposition can be regarded as, as loyal to the good of the country and that therefore the, their views will be respected. And it, it's not. And that's um, the expectation that the, the, it's nice people game and we'll play by the rules and no. So, okay. I would suggest that the maximum number of people from the opposition who show up to question period be three or one with some supporting people. That the honor of being the sole person in question period from the opposition be located on the basis agreed to by the opposition party. Because I think to carry on the way we are now is to play Mr. Harper's game. And it's a game that he has accumulated all the power to win. And so we're conceding the ground to him. So, and in the committee processes, uh, a similar approach. It'll get a lot of attraction. You have mentioned the, the, the attention. Uh, you have mentioned ignorance as the primary fault of the government. It's our primary fault. It comes back to us. And the virtue of it getting so much attention is that you do something to erode that ignorance, if I can coin that phrase. So what do these people do who are not going to be in committee, not going to be either? This is the craziest part of me. I'd suggest they make themselves available to Senate committees so that sober second consideration can be given there, that they make themselves available to um, institutions of parliament, the parliament the budget officer, the I don't know the names of it, but there are a number who are constrained by their budget, <coughs> part of the way that Harper's attacking. Yes, I will. Almost there. <laughs> um, so that, that more resources are available without additional cost. And even, as happened in the States, um, constitute a sort of NGO um, fact-finding body that invites in uh, donations and publicizes. This is how the 47% um, video got, again, you know, of Romney's speech. That's how it got out there. Somebody taped it and sent it to one of these uh, yeah. NGOs that had been set up uh, to make up for yeah. weak media. Thank you. Okay, well, there's a lot of questions there. For Matt's question first, I think there should be an obligation to consult. Now, I do believe in representative democracy, so the logical extension of your suggestion would be that we don't really need MPs at all. We could do everything through polling, and we could just have a buzzer in everyone's home, and in the morning when you wake up, the question would be, do we want to raise the GST by 1%, and everyone would go to their buzzer, and that would be it. I really do we could like take the idea first. of representative democracy in that... In the instance where, it's hard to imagine what the example would be because the people, the voters of Sagittal Islands and in all my town halls over and over again, I keep being asked to do those very things that I believe in the most myself, which is wonderful. But imagine I had a crisis of conscience where my voters wanted me to do one thing and I really felt I couldn't for some significant reason. I think the obligation there is to go to the voters again and say, look, this is how it is. You elected me in the complex areas of my character, one of the things I can't do is change my vote to vote for capital punishment. I'm just thinking of one that would be really impossible for me. And if, the, if it looked like the polls showed that the voters of Sagittal Island suddenly wanted capital punishment, maybe only for Enbridge executives. <laughs> <laughs> representative democracy, the obligation to report back, the obligation to consult, but not necessarily always to vote with what appears to be the majority, because that's the other aspect. Sometimes a majority can ignore a minority need, but I think absolutely we work as MPs. Again, political parties aren't mentioned in the Constitution. The Constitution is pretty vague. I mean, it just says members of Parliament are elected uh, for these constituencies and these numbers, but it's pretty clear our job is to represent our constituents because political parties aren't mentioned. So, yes, I would support that, but with that little wink wrinkle. Okay. In terms of fear, very interesting question about what is it, is Stephen F. Harper afraid of things? He certainly has instilled fear everywhere. I'll tell you this one little story. When he killed the National Roundtable on Environment and Economy, now I 
I worked on the creation of the National Roundtable when I worked with Tom Millen. And after I left government and under a different government, correct hand, well, actually, Sheila Copps was in at the time appointed me to the National Roundtable. I ended up being vice chair of the National Roundtable. So I mentioned these things by way of my bias in favor of the National Roundtable. But when I was trying, in the desperate effort to try to save something that was being destroyed in C-38, I, I started, I asked everyone in my office, I pulled some of my, my brilliant, wonderful volunteers and interns and staff in Ottawa, with a really teeny weeny little budget. And I said, Let, let's call through the names of the people who served on the round table over the years and see how many of them are willing to sign a statement calling for this, because they're from right across the spectrum. And one of the saddest calls, and I ended up calling it back myself because it was heartbreaking. This was an industry CEO who said, I would love to sign the letter. And I can't believe I'm saying this as a Canadian. I never thought I'd hear myself say this, but I have three children working in the civil service, and they have my last name, and I don't want them to lose their jobs. So there's that level of fear going on in the system. Stephen Harper was quoted once as saying that he said, I don't like to hire anyone unless I see fear in their eyes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so what is he afraid of? I think he is quite fearful of losing control. And when I say losing control, I mean control over everything. Uh, I've observed him closely over many years. And one of the odder things that happened to me after I was first elected, and I do apologize, particularly to Donald, who's trying to control me. But uh, <laughs> my, before I had my hip replacement, I don't know how many of you remember me on my cane. I was in a lot of pain. And I was waiting for the elevator to go from the ground floor in Farland but second floor where House of Commons is. And the security guard stepped in front of the elevator and said, I'm sorry, ma'am, the elevator's off service for the Prime Minister. <laughs> what? That's what I said. I said, wait, what, what do you mean? You mean I can't ride on this elevator because Stephen Harper is going to be in it soon and I can't go in the other side? Well, that's right, ma'am. And I suddenly started paying a lot of attention because I hadn't before. How does he move around? Now, having been in and around Ottawa for a long time, I was used to running into correct now in the, in the House of Commons when I was there as a Sierra Club person. And I would, you know, generally accost him and ask him what he was going to say about climate change. We'd end up having quarrels. And, you know, he was accessible to anyone who happened to be inside the parliament. Um, and I remember running into Paul Martin and Brian Lord. They were, they'd wander about. Once you get into the House of Commons, you've gone through all the security stuff. Why not? So I started wondering, well, Stephen Harper's budget budget for personal security for Stephen Harper is more than twice what it was for Gretchen. This isn't the PMO budget I mentioned earlier, 10 million. This is a different budget. The Prime Minister's security budget is